I'm John Batchelor. Gordon Chang, my colleague, is here. And we're off to Tonga. Used to be known, I learned from Wikipedia, as the Friendly Islands. Captain Cook was there. And not until the 21st century did it come into play as a world uh, battlefield between the forces of... Evil. Yes, China. And the forces of disorder. And it's a kingdom. So we need help with this because I didn't quite exi- know it existed at all. Cleo Pascal is, joins us. She's an associate fellow, Energy, Environment, and Resources at Chatham House. She's also the author of Global Warring, How Environmental, Economic, and Political Crises Will Redraw the World Map on China in the South Pacific. All right, Cleo, I'm convinced. I've looked it up, and they're not laughing at me. 103,000 people, 748 square kilometers. Why? What does China find in the Tonga Islands? Good evening. Good evening. Hi. It has multiple advantages that the U.S. hasn't quite uh, acknowledged yet since the end of the Cold War. First of all, strategic positioning. It has satellite launch slots. It's in the middle of a trade corridor between Asia and South America and Australia, if you're heading the other way. It has seabed minerals. It has fisheries. Um, and it's part of a consortium within the Pacific that control about 14 votes in international fora. So they've been very instrumental in things like the uh, potentially the U.S. Security Council uh, voting um, and that sort of thing. So they are they seem very small, but they're not. They have a much bigger weight in international affairs than one would expect. Cleo, you've told me that as soon as the Chinese invaded Tonga, and figuratively of course, but as soon as the Chinese discovered Tonga, you have all of these people leaving Fujian province and elsewhere going to Tonga. There was an influx of crime. And what I found fascinating is the attitudes of the Chinese embassy in Tonga towards Chinese crime. Could you just sort of explain this? Because I think this is absolutely illustrative of what's going on here. Yeah, it's a very interesting phenomenon. The Chinese, uh, there's of course been a big Chinese community throughout the Pacific uh, for quite a long time, but there's a new generation. They've come mostly through the last five to ten years, and it's a different population group. And it's very targeted in the way that engages not only in Tonga, but in other countries as well. You see it in Fiji, you see it in Samoa. Uh, largely uh, kind of commercial sector, the most visible section. So uh, they took over about 90% of the retail sector uh, in Tonga in about 10 years. Now, if you're running a little shop, you have a good excuse to bring in containers. And uh, you have a good excuse to, you know, have friendly relations with the local custom guy to help bring in your container unverified. And what we're seeing is that while the customs guy might think it's just school books and pencils, it's uh, a little bit more complicated than that. You're starting to see meth labs, Chinese-run meth labs spring up in places like Fiji. And in Tonga, what it's done is uh, bring in crime that they haven't seen before. Uh, the first human trafficking case in Tongan history was tried last year. It was a, a woman from China who had brought in two young women from China, t- telling them they were going to be uh, waitresses. Then she forced them into prostitution to serve the Chinese community within Tonga. The Tongans only found out because one of them got stabbed and ended up in the hospital. And then going through the court system became very difficult because the uh, Chinese embassy was very uncooperative. They didn't help with background checks on the main woman involved. The translator, the court translator, was mistranslating the evidence of these uh, unfortunate two young women. And it was only after a few Tongans stepped in and said, this, this doesn't really make any sense, that, the, that if the, the trial was redirected and the woman was end up convicted. So the crime within the community uh, is extremely corrosive and it's starting to spread outside the community. Uh, Chinese or newly arrived Chinese are, are hiring Tongans to torch other Chinese shops. There's been murder, there's been torture, there's been kidnapping, all within the last two years. And all within the Chinese community, completely unseen in Tonga before. Cleo, I don't want to make light, but I think you just said meth labs, right? This is Breaking Bad Tonga style. What? (laughs) There's nothing in the economy. What? I'm... This is a subsistence, agricultural-based economy. Their well, chief the income is remittances. Why are the Chinese there? What do they? What? What? Do, what gain? 
Well, the meth lab, just to be accurate, that for I, I wasn't clear, the meth lab, that, that big meth lab was in Fiji, so they manufacture in Fiji. Okay, okay, that's United that's States. several hundred miles to the west, oh, right, that, right. Exactly right, and and that then gets shipped into uh, Australia right. or New Zealand. Right. Um, and a lot of the stuff that's happening, Tonga is considered in some way a stepping stone, so... Um, there seems to be, as Gordon was mentioning, you know, people who could not afford to fly to Tonga and set up a shop or flying to Tonga and set up a shop. There seems to be some other backing involved. What, what is this, laundering money? What are they doing? Well, They're I think t- it's probably a number of things, but one of them is, as, as Cleo is saying, is that it is corroding Tongan society. It's got changing that. it revenue. I got that. They're taking it over, but to make it uh, uh, offshore banking? Um, I, 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 is there is it is it for tourism? I, it, it's a series of small islands in the middle of the Pac- South Pacific. It might yeah. be good for music, but I'm just I'm uh, maybe the Chinese have a whimsical side that I'm unaware of. <laughs> yeah, I think not. I think um, uh, there's partial, partially in terms of the location. They're they're actually highly geostrategic. So I if see. you look at what happened at Kiribati, another small country in the Pacific. Um, China China set up a base there that was being used for monitoring U.S. communications from the bases in the northern Pacific. And I, I suspect, I can't prove, and I'm thinking about it very carefully, that there is uh, potentially a redundant system of uh, defense installations that look like dual use. So this is use. the Spratly Islands in the South Pacific. They're just taking over what is available, and they'll think about it later. I think they're thinking about it now. Okay. And uh, partially, one of the things that it does is it corrodes the role of uh, Australia and New Zealand within the international community, isolates them even more. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, the, the game Go, where you just take pieces on the board and eventually your enemy realizes they're blocked in and they have nowhere to move. Have the Australians commented on these incidents? The Australians are playing a very funny game. Uh, they tell the West, don't worry, the rest of their allies here say here in D.C., don't worry, everything's under control. But Australia itself um, has an odd relationship with China, and that's something that really needs to be discussed. What direction is Australia heading in? So I think Gordon, Gordon can tell you well about you know, books by people like Hugh White saying, very influential defense guy in Australian defense saying, that the U.S. should share the Pacific with China. And that book was launched by by Paul Keating, former prime minister. Again, very high-level guy. So Australia seems to be kind of rolling over and parts of the strategic community playing dead before the fight's even been fought. Cleo Pascal is Associate Fellow Energy, Environment and Resources at Chatham House. Tonga, the kingdom of Tonga in the South Pacific. Gordon Chang of Forbes.com. I'm John Batchelor.